57talk.com. Gary Cubetta back, Scottsdale, Arizona, and we're taping this on a Monday night. Actually, Tuesday night, November 17th, and it's my pleasure to introduce Robert and Hamela Allen, who just produced one of the best wrestling books, 2009, The Soli Chronicles, The Life and Times of the Great Gordon Soli. Pleasure to have you guys with us. Oh, thanks for having us. Thank you. Nice to be on. Uh, the book, I've read it, five stars. Tremendous book. It details the life of Gordon Soli, 308 pages, and uh, you know, Gordon was one of the most influential figures in wrestling in the 70s and the 80s, and this really did honor to, to the life he served in the world of professional wrestling. I want to congratulate you guys. It was a lot. There's a lot of hard work involved in the book. Thank you. Thank you. What what motivate? I know there was a book previously about Gordon, right? Yes, actually. And uh, before Gordon passed away, we were sitting there one day, and he, he turned to Pam and said, "I'm going to leave you all my writing." And it became clear that he wanted his writings published, uh, and he had planned on doing a book on wrestling too. So the first thing we put out was his short stories and his poetry with about 180 pictures. That was in 2005, and then we had the drive to finish the the longer t- task was to do his life story, and that ended up taking us about eight years. There's some biographical information in the first book but not as in-depth as the second. The, this book is the better of the two, obviously, right? Uh, they're in two different classes. I mean, to read Dad's poetry and his prose, I mean, he not only could he paint a picture with his voice, he could paint a picture with pen. I mean, he just words the right words. We're prejudiced. We like them both. <laughs> well, I don't blame you. I, ha- I haven't, I got to be honest, I haven't read the first one, so I can't say, but this one, this is this is one of the great books. Scott Teal uh, has done some really great books, and I, I think that, that the book, how is the book doing? It, I would think, you know, the problem, the problem is Gordon is, is removed from the, the public spotlight, obviously, by 15 years. Uh, the old, old school fans would love the book. I haven't really seen that much about it. H- how's it doing overall? Uh, we started out great, went down, and we're picking up again because it's, like you said, getting the word out there. We've had a lot of nice reviews. Uh, Mike Mooneyham did a, a really nice in-depth review. and It hit in the Tampa Tribune, the Miami Herald. Um, our local paper, the Gainesville Times, did a feature on it. Slam. And Slam Wrestling just did a really nice review, so... We're we're starting to get some nice reviews from people out there. Bob D'Angelo from uh, Tampa Bay Online also did an excellent review. Yeah, well, it's deserved, I'll tell you, because it, it reads great. And Gordon, of course, it's got a lot in the book. And I know that you've gotten some criticism about it, about his early stock, yard, stock car days. He was a. Uh, t- tell me a little bit about that. Well, it- the criticism, I guess, came uh, in just one or two spots, but they thought we put too much on there on racing. But that was Gordon's life. In the 50s and 60s, he was just as involved in stock car racing as he was in wrestling because he uh, actually started on some dirt track in the Tampa Bay area announcing stock car races, and it was phenomenal because Pam and I went to Golden Gate Speedway in Tampa where he announced races on Friday and Saturday nights, and at the same time, he was doing five radio shows a, a day during the week, plus championship wrestling from Florida. So you could see him on, on TV, He's you very go visible. to the racetrack, <laughs> go to a charity event. He was everywhere. He was, he was just a, a master at multitasking. Well, and I think the criticism is is, is a little ridiculous in that uh, Gordon was an announcer in the southern states of the United States, and of course, stock car, stock car racing in the 60s and 70s, huge. So it kind of was a natural progression for him to go from one to the other as far as the local fan base, and the respect he got was, was overwhelming. Well, it was also something that he held dear to his heart, was racing. Yeah. So, I mean, it was just, he went with his passion. Uh, the other thing I really like about the book is you really don't hold much back about Gordon in his personal life. I mean, you're, you're his, Pam, you're his daughter, right? Correct. And the book is, it's kind of tough on him in some ways. Was it tough to make that decision to go in that direction? <sighs> Um, yes and no. Uh, yes, just from the emotional end, you know, you're learning about your father, you're, you're telling what happened. But the other part was Tom McEwen, uh, who uh, was a sports editor for the Tampa Tribune, uh, said, if you're going to do it, you tell the good with the bad. Otherwise, it's not a biography. I mean, if we just paint it like it's a rosy red world and, and their life is wonderful all the time, then we're not being real truthful to that person, are we, or, or to society. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it makes the book very three-dimensional, and it makes you appreciate Gordon all the more. Absolutely. He's real. It becomes even more real than just that person sitting on the screen, you know, on Saturday nights uh, that you you watch. He he has feelings. He has issues. He has loves and hates, and and he becomes more real to you. He just didn't have any issues when he was at the microphone. Nope. Never existed then. (laughs) He was in heaven. How how disappointed was he when uh, Ole and Jack Briscoe and Jerry Briscoe gave up, and of course they gave it up in, in a lot of different ways, but gave up the contract on TBS to Vince. Was he very disappointed? Because that was a feature spot for him. He was 
pissed. He was totally upset. He was angry. He was, uh, you know, he's hosted the number one televised wrestling show in the world, and all of a sudden it's gone, disappeared. So, yeah, he was hot. He was disheartened. And uh, he always said the demise of a lot of the territories was because of the greed of the promoters. And uh, in that case, it was Ole was a holdout. You know, he uh, wasn't one of the original sellers. He didn't want to sell it. He wanted to keep it. And uh, But Gordon was very, very upset. But You know, and, and going back to our first book, uh, when you read some of the poetry in there, if you've read the second book, they probably came out backwards. Uh, it explains a lot of what he wrote in Something Left Behind. I mean, it's just dead on. It's like, wow, okay. Pa- Pam, do you remember him that week, how he was when he got the announcement that Vince would be taking over TBS? Did you no. talk to him that week? Yeah, it was about two weeks later. No, he was not a happy person. I mean, he had such a big role with TBS, and then it was just stripped away. Yeah, he- but it wasn't just it wasn't just Dad's role. It was wrestling, you know, per se, and, the, and it, it, it started to change. Yeah. And that, that, I think, bothered him. He was an NWA man all the way. It amazed me is the fact that there were so many fans that were loyal to him. That probably helped fuel the fire because they, they slammed TBS with phone calls the next day. And letters. They wrote letters. And in fact, we put some of the information from the letters in the book there. And uh, But Gordon, you know, he didn't want to say things bad about people in the nope. industry. So he'd go on television if anybody said anything, you know. He'd just let it go. His thing was, if you said something bad about somebody, it would come back to get you. So why cause trouble? Did Gordon blame anybody in particular? Did he blame the Briscoes, who he was very close with in Florida? Did he, or was it Ole, or was it just Jim Barnett? What, who did he target as the blame for TBS uh, going to Vince? <coughs> Probably Vince. He didn't blame uh, the Briscoes. They were no. good friends, and they would have, uh, from what Jack has said, they would have suffered a long court battle. Otherwise, you know, the only thing that made sense to them was Saul at the time. And uh, I never heard Gordon say a bad word about mm-hmm. Jack or Jerry Briscoe. Not ever. Uh, but with McMahon, the only the, the real uh, I'm say the real bad spoke in the wheel was the fact that Gordon re- was loyal to the old territory. And here comes Vince McMahon this, out of the Northeast and offering. They were offered made Gordon a nice offer to stay on and. You know, work for WWF, but he felt his loyalties remained to the old territories, and he said no. And he always said that they wanted him to wear a tuxedo, and he wasn't going to wear a GD tuxedo. <laughs> That's the reason he didn't go to work for him. But you know, I never thought no. that was it. He was, like I said in the book, he had loyalty to the old territories in his veins, along with uh, vodka and the plaque from four cigarettes a day. So <laughs> he said, four if he, packs. I mean, he was always told if he went to the dance with somebody, that's who he should go home with. Did did he regret the decision later on not going with Vince? Uh, once he got into the corporate era and he was with WCW, things were totally different than the old territorial days. And he made a comment at one time, you know, if he'd seen that the corporate era was going to end up being like this anyway, he would have been better off at that point in time just go to work for Vince's corporation. I don't know that he regretted it, other than he suffered for it for about five years because he was kind of doing smaller promotions until he went back with WCW five years later in 89. Then he was back in the big time. If you ever see that video on YouTube when he comes back to TBS, he is just He's loving every minute of it. Back where he belongs. When he hosted the show that one week, right? Well, when they came, when they brought it back. Yeah, so, yeah. Because in '85, Ole started it again. Only instead of Georgia Championship Wrestling, it was called Championship Wrestling from, from Georgia. Georgia. Okay, right? you're you're speaking of the when Ole brought it back. But then later on, when he worked for WCW, I remember there was a week that uh, Jim Ross was away, and I believe and and Gordon did host it one more time on TBS right around the 1990s. Do you remember that? It was in '89, late '89 maybe yeah 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 i do and he got a good reception from people they were glad to see him back on tbs i I thought that crockett made a big mistake in not bringing gordon over to tbs i I think that the entire tbs experience with crockett was botched uh a lot of squash matches which had been the case before but even more so and i I never thought that uh jim ross and uh, dave crockett had the same charisma as gordon uh on air was gordon upset that crockett just totally ignored him yeah he had his own announcer and uh, it just left Gordon out of the lurch. In fact, another guy, Bill Watts, got eaten up in that too because he was up and coming in the show and one of the deals was a network was that I think Crockett had the exclusive so Watts show had to go and it was getting pretty popular. Yeah, I, I just, I think Jim Crockett made a mistake not bringing Gordon. It, was there, it's in the book, but was there heat between Gordon and Jim Crockett and Dusty Rhodes was also involved and Gordon had been so influential in Dusty's career you would think that Dusty would have wanted Gordon to come over but he, he didn't. 
Uh, it, it's not something Gordon dwelled on. He was he thought that at the time with Championship Wrestling, Florida was still a viable organization, and then he started doing shows for Continental, and then yeah. he started getting some national exposure because he was doing pro wrestling this week with Joe Petticino, and that Joe was putting it in the major markets, Chicago and and uh, you know Dallas and New York and all over the country. So he thought you know life was good again. But then the small promotions got gobbled up by Crockett, and uh, then he wasn't too thrilled when Championship Wrestling in Florida ended. He was upset again for the second time in like three years there went georgia and there went florida pam, both- pam a lot of the sheets had reported you know the newsletter sheets had reported that gordon had refused at near the end of his life a uh, treatment for um the throat cancer he had and I, I never really was sure that that was the correct story D- did he refuse treatment or or was is there more to it than that well dad said he'd rather have <clears throat> quality of life than quantity yeah and uh he just couldn't see being sick <laughs> When he was already sick, he was going to get sicker, you know, and that, yeah. that just didn't... After his surgery, I mean, if they had given him treatment for two months, he might have gained one more month of life. He didn't see the, he didn't see the sense in it. In fact, he even made the statement that, you know, they told me six months, look at it's seven months, I beat it. And I said, yeah, you did, yeah, you did. And, and people close to him, you know, and, uh, and these are days when chemo and uh, radiation weren't as good as treatments, as, as effective as they are now. So he saw a lot of people take treatments of chemo and his wife, his, a lot of his good friends. They took it and they just suffered and died, and and that had an impact on his thinking. So it wasn't it wasn't so much refusing the treatment as even if he accepted the treatment, it would have been more more pain and maybe just a little bit more life, right? Yeah, yeah. At that point in time, now if he dealt with it years before when they first had polyps on the throat, that would have that might have made a difference because. But his wife got s- sick; he was more worried about her. He kind of put it on a back burner. Early diagnosis is always a, a thing, and he kept putting it off because he wanted to keep announcing. He was he was retired, but he was still doing Ring Warriors, and he did shows for World Legion Wrestling. Uh, he stayed active, and he was an officer in the NWA, and he wanted to keep his voice, too. So invasive throat surgery was not something Gordon wanted to do as an announcer, or just, you know, the last thing he wanted to deal with. Well, and it's understandable. I mean, refusing surgery, refusing treatment is one thing, but refusing treatment that might only add a, a few more weeks to your life is is, a, is another, obviously. Absolutely. He wasn't being a, a martyr, not, you know, not doing it. He just he didn't see the purpose. He was going to enjoy life what he had left of it, and he wanted to be able to get in the car and drive and go to cricketers and do the things that he did all the time. And the and, and he was hilarious too. One of my still one of the funniest things I ever heard is like they schedule appointments for him still, even though he was terminally ill and then they discovered other things and said, you know, we need to go in and check this out or whatever and they'd call for his next appointment or he'd call in and cancel because he was sick. He told them he was sick. I Maybe mean, people call their doctor and say, I'm not coming today because 'cause I'm sick, you know? <laughs> did did he, he get did he get recognized a lot when you guys would go out with him? Because I would think Gordon solely on T B S Hall you know, and on Florida Championship Wrestling. Very recognizable, right? <coughs> All the time. amazing. When I first met him, it was in 71, and we're walking down just in Tampa, in front of a, a corner of the Tampa Tribune and a service station, whatever, and people would run up to him. Mr. Sully, Mr. Sully, can I have your autograph? Can I have your autograph? And everywhere we went, they gave him the red carpet treatment. It was Mr. Sully, where, you know, where would you like to sit? And they'd wait on him hand and foot. They all knew him. And even later in life, when he thought maybe he wouldn't be as recognizable, he was living in a small town, Port Ritchie, which is uh, like northwest of Tampa, Port Ritchie. and a different county altogether. And we would, wherever we go, people would still recognize him and come up and want his autograph or want to talk to him. It was amazing. Pam, t- tell me, tell me, did Gordon near the end, did he did he have a lot of regrets about the way the NWA had worked out? Because, you know, a lot of people today think that Vince was just the natural uh, leader of professional wrestling going forward. But with TBS and Gordon, there was such an advantage there for Jim Barnett and Georgia Championship Wrestling. Did he have any regrets? Did he ever say anything to you like I wish this worked out differently? Dad didn't have any regrets on on he only had three regrets in his life and and that wasn't one of them. I mean he I think he wished that the old school had stayed more with it, you know, instead of uh he got frustrated with some of the storylines and it was just going in a different direction. I don't think as much it was the the name of the on the logo anymore uh-uh. as it was content. Uh-huh. He didn't like uh you know, it was a me 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 generation he called it and they, they wanted a faster paced matches that were all they wanted more gymnasts. More high percussion, uh, yeah. over in five minutes, where he used to call matches.
matches that lasted for an hour. And he was very much against some of the sexual themes and what he called distasteful stuff that should remain behind closed doors. So well, it, was a, it was supposed to be a family thing, you know, when people would go and watch wrestling and take the family or they got together on Saturday. I mean, it was family entertainment, and it changed, and he didn't, he didn't like that. Yeah, well, I'm going to tell you, this is a great book. It's five stars. There are a lot of good wrestling books. There are a lot of so-so wrestling books. There are poor wrestling books. This is one of the top books, 2009, no question about it. I got to ask you guys a question. Why isn't it available? Because I checked on Amazon. A lot of people have been emailing me about having you guys on. Is there a reason it's not available on Amazon.com? Well, initially, Scott Teal, who uh, was one of the authors in the book, too, and, and also the publisher, um, normally most publishers have a certain amount of clientele out there that they want to get to first, and then they'll go to Amazon later. And uh, basically, when you go to the book distributors, they take over half of your book <laughs> yeah. before, you, before you ever see it. Some of them are 60%. Yeah. So initially, most publishers will sell through their own site first to maximize profits, and then they'll go to Amazon or whatever. So that's planned down the road. Well, right I, now, right now, people have to go to Crowbar Press, and that's where they can get it. Well, I'd love to see it up on Amazon because I'd love to see the type of reviews it would get, and I think oh. they would be overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. I thought, well, anybody that gets it right now, we can post reviews on crowbarpress.com. Uh, uh, Scott set up a piece on there, and I think we've got a, like two or three. I, I keep forgetting to tell people when they email me, it's like, post a review there. But uh, Scott Scott was really, really helpful in this book. I mean, he, he was he was uh, part of a team, and we worked really well together. And if one had a question, somebody in the group found the answer or had the answer. And then we were really fortunate to have J. Michael Kenyon, you know, right along with us. So I thought we had two of the better, you know, wrestling historians available to answer our questions. What, was Scott involved in the writing process? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah it, we had a basic manuscript uh, after about six years, and then we hooked up with Scott and sent it to him. And uh, number one, he kept back on the racing because, you know, we run out of pages, basically, <laughs> uh, make it a book that was too, you know, overpriced. And then number two, he, I had what he called a lot of fluff in the wrestling part and uh, things that people just probably wouldn't give a hoot about. And he wanted more interviews. And then it took about another year, and we got to the point where we were sending edits back daily. Oh, yeah. So one time, we sent 47 pages of edits back and forth, and then in different parts, Scott added his insight, where he actually wrote some, some pages and added, filled in blanks, really, and it worked out perfect. Mm -hmm. Then he sent it to J. Michael Kenyon for some thoughts, and he's like dealing with Simon from uh, uh, American, American Idol, Idol. only he, this should be called American Writers, because he'll come back with a harsh comment here or a humorous one there, but he, the guy's amazing. It's all constructive, too. I mean, he, he just he is awesome. And then finally, after four of us went through it, it was done. And uh, well, I, well, it really shows. I think Scott. Look, I'm just gonna. I've had trouble with Scott on certain issues, but I will tell you. And I've said it to Scott. He's one of the top uh, two or three writers in the industry, and it shows. I mean, you can see the book is just beautifully yep. written, and you guys put a lot of work into it. There's a lot of detail, but the writing style. It, it's really easy to read. You can read the book in two nights and really enjoy it. That doesn't frustrate you at all. In fact, you. I kind of wish you had left some of the stuff in. I could have gone for 400 pages. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you do that on, a, on, a, on a, another edition. We well, you know on October 6th, I started Dad's uh, Facebook uh, fan page. Yeah. And as of tonight, it was uh, 1720, 1720 uh, fans are listed on it. You're kidding. No, no in five no. weeks, he has 1,700 fans. In and wow. Weeks. I have talked to or instant messaged and emailed some of the most awesome people in the world. I mean, they are great. They're, they're, they're knowledgeable. They know they're wrestling. Uh, and they come from all walks of life. I mean, like uh, um, Percival. He and I instant message each other back and forth. Wait, Percival and, who? Percival Friend? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I had him on just the other day. Yeah. That's it, the reason that we hooked up, really. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> because of him, he deserves the credit for putting Absolutely. you and Pam in contact yeah, on Facebook. Terrific. Yeah. And, yeah. and he, he was the type of person, you know, when he was active as a manager, could incite a riot, you know? I mean, the guy was just phenomenal. So you have 1,700... And 20. That's amazing. And, and how many... How how long did that take? Five uh, weeks. Five weeks. You guys are great promoters. Wow. Well, she's doing. She's doing that. I'm doing other stuff. So okay, you've got to post a link to this interview up on that Facebook site, please. Oh, absolutely. definitely, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I told Bob. I said, "How funny." I said, "You know, my dad was a promoter, and I'm promoting my dad." You know, I mean, it's like wow. <laughs> you know, it's pretty cool. Well, I just wish it was 1984 again, and that uh, Oli and Jerry and uh, Jack had got along a little better, and that they had kept TBS and maybe gone in business with Ted Turner, and that your dad had had another 10 years behind the mic because i'll tell you there were some great times back at tbs but not so much after 85 it's got well little... everybody says that the most important thing was the memory
memories that they, they were conjured up by reading this or even the mention of, of wrestling back then. And it was all good memories, and I think we need more of those. We've been to some wrestling events in northern Georgia. We've been to a couple of festivals and Rome Literary Festival. People come up, and they they will all tell you Gordon Sully stories. It's amazing. And they were good times in their life. And like Pam said, they can tell you who in their family today. My grandmother used to watch that lady that's putting our book in a local bookstore. Grew up watching Gordon in Alabama because her family would have a, a tournament, a car tournament with two or three car tables of people while all the kids played outside. And then the kids came in and they watched Gordon Sully on Saturday nights while their parents played these card games. And they've all got a different story of what it meant to them. But the coolest thing is the fact that it's always fond memories. They always tell you good things and what an important part it was in their life that they could watch Gordon Sully every week. And they say we miss the old school wrestling over and over again. And yeah. part, of, part of what made it great was Gordon because he just yep. called the matches so straight up. And, you know, one thing that I think is kind of sad is he, he never really got the chance to call any pay-per-views or, or uh, big live cards. It was always the TV squash match type events that he did. I, I know there were a couple of exceptions like Starcade, uh, yeah. I think, 83. But he never really got a chance to do those type of shows. And I think that his style would have been, obviously, it's much better than what uh, takes place today. Well, there's a lot he of showing going on. He had a little say-so in that, because Jim Ross talked about it in the book when Gordon came back. He would have been more than happy to give Gordon the lead, but Gordon said he would feel better at that point in time just doing color commentary. And they started him doing some, he did interviews on the Class of or Class of Champions pay-per-views, because he interviewed wrestlers on those. Right. And then he did some color commentary, and then they put him on one of their syndicated shows, like Worldwide Wrestling or whatever, on Saturday night. Right, right. So he got his time there, but part of that was his decision, that he would kind of ease back into the business and that he wasn't going to go go for the number one position. Well, guess, he was but. never that kind of person. It wasn't about dad. It was about wrestling. Well, it was okay. about racing. You know, it was he always trying to put he's always trying to put the other ones over. Well, around eighty nine or ninety, we start, and not that uh, John Madden announced uh, football until he was, I believe, seventy three or seventy four. Uh, you know, Gordon was getting a little bit older. How old was he around? How old would he have been around nineteen eighty nine? Sixty. Sixty. He was still plenty young enough to do it. Obviously. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he, and, and he would have kept doing it, but he'd had enough of it by ninety five. He was more than happy to walk away. Yeah. And but then he still couldn't stay away from it. Like I said, Howard Brody and Hiro Matsuda got him to come in and do uh, Ring Warriors. Yep. And that was seen in that was I think a number one show on Eurosport, which was ESPN's counterpart over there. And then they made a decision uh, ninety six or ninety seven to to discontinue uh, wrestling mm-hmm. in that format. So that show went. And then he still went to World Legion Wrestling with Harley Race and Carl Lauer uh, in Springfield, Mass Springfield, Missouri, and they did some shows out there for World Legion Wrestling. That's and that was start, that was starting to actually catch some wind, and then he would start losing his voice. That was with David Martez, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we had we had Howard on on Friday night, and he spoke in, in detail about Gordon. He loved Gordon, period. Yes, yes, Just he loved did. him, and, uh, you know, it really upset him the, the how things kind of worked out. They were working on all kinds of, you know, creative deals in the late uh, 90s, and it just didn't quite work out. Well, Dad was a type A personality, too. I mean, he was he was constantly in motion. I mean, he would he would tell me, I can't sleep at night. He says, my, my mind is just going all the time. I mean, it was, like, nonstop. And if you go out with him, you mentioned people recognize him. I mean, Malio's used to be a favorite hangout for politicians and entertainers and athletes, whatever, in, in Tampa, probably the number one spot back in the 70s through the 80s. Um, and we'd be sitting there having lunch, and a race car driver would come up and say, hey, Gordon, you know, I need to get a sponsor for a car. He said, hey, give me give me a call tomorrow, babe. I need help him get a sponsor for a car, you know. Uh, another guy wanted a sponsorship for a speedboat race. I mean, all kinds of people. He'd sit there and talk to George Steinbrenner at lunch, you know, or Johnny Bench or uh, who is the 49ers guy, the, the Bartolo. I mean, there's a lot of cool people that hung out in there. But then there'd be the average Joe would walk up and say, hey, I need your help. And he was very accommodating. I think that's one of the reasons people that worked with him speak so highly of him because he was always doing stuff to help the business and to help them further their careers. It's almost like he was service-oriented. Well, and the the fans, he definitely served. I, uh, one more question, then I'm going to let you go. Eddie Graham, the suicide, just a, a devastating mm-hmm. for the NWA, uh, mm-hmm. the NWA already faltering. Was Gordon surprised by that? <coughs> I don't know. He was pretty well devastated at the time because of, but I think the only thing that made sense was that he was depressed. Uh, things had gone downhill in his life uh, in about every way you could imagine. A guy that's on the top of the world, a millionaire, life is great, and all of a sudden it's not. It just sucks, you know? Um, so be- besides being upset by it, I don't know that he was, I'm, I'm sure he was surprised he wouldn't think that would Eddie would do that, but he knew he was very despondent at the time. But then the business changed because instead of talking to Eddie or Cowboy, there's a committee sitting there that has to vote on everything. Yep. So he 
sitting in board meetings because when we go to the sports or with him, he'd walk up and spend a few minutes uh, talking to Eddie about what they're going to do, and then we'd go to lunch, you know, or whatever. And then they would just do it. But they, they also, they had a brotherhood. I, I've said that before to somebody else. I can't remember where, but they were like a banded brotherhood, and part of it was gone. And I, I've said it many times before. Uh, it doesn't seem, to, I don't know how much it registers, but when Cowboy Electro was there with Eddie and Gordon, championship wrestling from Florida was pretty well invincible. Yep. And then Cowboy left first because of failing health, and then Eddie, you know, ended his life, and then Gordon could not keep that thing going by himself. And But when those three guys were there, that to me was championship wrestling in Florida. Cowboy, Eddie, and Gordon. Yeah, Vince, if Vince had been in, let's say, tried to expand nationally in the 70s, if the timeline had been a little different, I don't think he would have had a chance. I mean, championship wrestling from Florida would have been the one uh, to do the expansion, not Vince expanding into Florida. Eddie would have kept him out of there. Yeah. If somebody tried, if people did try to invade, like, the local wrestling promotion, yeah. Cowboy would put it into that. Absolutely. And then as <laughs> Eddie, Eddie had a lot of political context, and uh, if people wanted to come into an arena, he'd get exclusive in the Jacksonville Coliseum. No other wrestling company could do a show there. He'd get exclusive at the Bayfront or the Sundome in Tampa or somewhere in Miami. So, no, up through the 70s going into the early 80s, nobody else was going to come in there and put a big yep. show on the floor. It just wasn't going to happen. And everybody wanted to work there because they wanted the exposure from being seen in a show that 5 million people were watching every week on a regional show. Yeah. Well, all I can say is I miss those days, and they're, they're never going to come back, and I miss those days, but uh, what are you going to do? Oh, you can relive a little bit of it with the Soli Chronicles. It's available. Tell me, let's say I've got my copy, but let's say one of our listeners wants to get a copy. Well, walk, walk me through the process. What do we, what do, we do? Go to crowbarpress.com. Crowbarpress.com. Scroll down to the bottom of the page, and you'll see the Soli Chronicles, and just click on it. Terrific. It's a great book. I mean, at, at twice the price, it's a, it's a bargain. It really is. An important oh, part of wrestling history is in the 300 pages. It really is. And I, I want to thank you, too, for taking the time to come out with us tonight. Absolutely. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. And was... make sure you link us up on that Facebook page. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, we'll look for it as soon as it's up there. We'll uh, put it up on the uh, page and send out an announcement to everybody. Yep. Thanks so much. Have a great night. You Thanks, too. Gary. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Bye.